Good evening and good afternoon to all of you. It's Dr. Scott Stoll, co-founder of the Plant Nutrition Project here on Instagram Live. And joining me soon will be Dr. Kaushik Reddy. This is a part of our Plant Nutrition Project conversations. And one of the things that I love to do is just have meaningful conversations with our colleagues to ask them questions that you know, we may not get to, um, to hear their answers. And I found through the years, we've had, this is our 10th anniversary of the Plant-Based Nutrition Healthcare Conference. And I found through the years in conversations with people in the hallways and uh, at the dinner tables, people have the most interesting lives. The, they've done incredible research. They are profound thinkers. And so these conversations are really an opportunity for us to dive in and uh, have some of these, these interesting conversations. So while we're waiting for Dr. Um, Reddy to join us, I just want to mention a couple of, um, of important updates with the Plant Nutrition Project. For most of you know that this year we launched really our legacy project, which is Plant Nutrition University. Uh, this is, um, I believe, will be the, the legacy of the Plant Nutrition Project as we're really reaching all the way back to the beginning of healthcare education. And when I say healthcare, I mean physical therapy, uh, chiropractic, dental, medical, nurse, health coach, uh, everybody in health education. We're reaching back to the beginning of their education and we're going to offer them everything that we've ever done in the Plant Nutrition Project, along with courses that are being developed every single month for free on a learning management system called Plant Nutrition University. And it's our sincere intention that we will be able to assist them in their learning journey with the information that for most of us took years to acquire. And they'll be able to learn in parallel with their traditional or allopathic educations and integrate kind of this plant-based nutrition lifestyle medicine right into their, their persona, their identity, their practice style, their philosophy, and they'll graduate from their programs with this profound and deep understanding of health, of healing, of the power of nutrition to prevent, suspend, and reverse disease, understanding the kind of intricacies of how lifestyle is influenced by behavior and the importance of community, all because they were able to access a learning management system for free during their education. And one of the important aspects of this as well that we're launching next year is a, um, an opportunity to begin um, uh, shepherding and uh, mentoring the next generation of leaders coming up. Uh, you know, it's something that we really need to think about as we're thinking about the legacy of, um, of this kind of lifestyle medicine, plant-based nutrition movement. We have to begin mentoring the leaders to step in, take over when people like me are, uh, are no longer leading. So we're creating this amazing mentorship platform that we want to uh, begin linking together students with all of us that are further along in our careers to help bring them along and, um, and shortcut that learning process for them. And so um, I just see these people. I, Hello, Nicole, it's so good to see you. And uh, all of you here, thank you for joining us. We have a nice crowd. Um, and I'm just going to ask Brooke, I know she's watching, to check in on uh, Dr. Kaushik and find out when he's going to be joining us. I don't see him yet. Let's see. Here he is. And I'm going to... Okay. Let's see. Sorry about this. Technology. There we go. Hey, Hi, Kaushik. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And for all of you who joined us, this is Dr. Kaushik Reddy, cardiologist with the VA Healthcare System Florida. And uh, really, you know, the reason I invited Dr. Reddy is because he is um, an absolutely deep thinker, um, not only around plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, but philosophy and life. And, you know, I think you made the comment at the uh, PBNHC last year that you and I are like brothers, that, uh, we, you know, our presentations overlapped in so many ways because we think so similarly. So I'm really excited that we have this opportunity this afternoon to have a conversation. Absolutely. Thank you. And I uh, appreciate the amazing work you and your team has been doing. And it was nothing but a pure joy 
to meet you and uh, have an opportunity to present at the last year's meeting. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kaushik. It's wonderful. So, you know, and just in our short time today, I wanted to just touch on three topics. Um, number one is LDL. You know, there are a lot of LDL deniers out there. And I just want to talk through the, the science, you know, briefly. <laughs> we could spend two days on this, but just briefly to, to hit on the, you know, some of the deep science of LDL and, you know, to help people understand uh, LT, LDL in context. Um, second, I, I want to talk about the importance of like mindfulness and stress um, mitigation on heart disease and health. And the last thing I want to talk about today, just to kind of set the stage, is a, a book that you gave me called The Lost Art of Healing by uh, Dr. Bernard Lone, um, you know, a famous cardiologist. And just that concept of, of healing and healthcare and what our role is and how that's been lost and how we can begin finding our way back to develop meaningful relationships and an atmosphere of healing inside of our clinics. All that in about 20 minutes, Kaushik. So. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, again, great questions and very interesting, you know, concepts to cover um, from, you know, the molecular basis of medicine to, you know, kind of reinventing ourselves as clinicians by the bedside, you know, from, you know, from bench to bedside type of a question. Great, great, great combination of three questions and, and I'll do the best I can. Uh, but like you said, each one of them, we could spend weeks if not months upon in long format discussions. Um, so going back to LDL, as some of you may know, um, you know, for the, you know, like you, you, you phrase the question that there are some deniers. And yes, you know, in the era of social media, you know, everybody has an opinion as we should, but in the matters of science, you know, there are experts and, you know, and there are people who have dedicated their entire lives, if not multiple lives of people. And, you know, when I come across this LDL denialism, I simply, to just to convince a lay person, said, look, let me pretend that I am a lay person. I have no idea about LDL. And I'm getting a message, one type of a message from social media, which is just somebody saying whatever they want to do. And other link to a Nobel website citing 11 Nobel Prizes behind the concept of LDL, you know, discovery, its receptors, its mechanisms, genetic data, clinical data, uh, pharmaceutical data uh, in support of LDL being causally linked and meeting all the nine criteria for cross causality including uh, Mendelian randomization. So yes, you know, it, I don't think it is, uh, you know, it probably is not settled in, in the parlance of social media and Twitter, but in, in clinical cardiology and, you know, preventive cardiology and, you know, cardiogenomics, uh, the causality of LDL is a settled issue. It is not an issue for debate. Uh, LDL is now causally linked um, to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. In terms of quantifying, the simplistic way of looking at it is that what is your risk? Are you, a, are you at a point where your intent of treatment or intent of lowering your LDL is primary prevention, meaning that you have never had a cardiovascular event. You never had an event, but you're concerned because you have family history or you have some other risk factors and you wanna do everything that you can possibly do to lower the risk. So there is this concept within clinical and you know, lipidology, the concept of humans being able to live to be 100 years old without developing atherosclerosis and incurring a related event. So people who publish this paper call that concept cholesterol years. You know, just to, to relate to something that we know a little bit more is pack years. You know, when we quantify the risk of smoking, we use pack years, number of years smoked times the number of packs smoked. So that gives you a quantification area under the curve type of a thing. So when I read that paper, I, I wrote an email, hey, you know, we missed a golden opportunity to, to, to coin this phrase properly where a lay person gets it. So I actually call it plaque years, meaning you take your LDL, what, no, it doesn't matter where your LDL is at, what your age doesn't matter take your LDL and you multiply that with your age and you'll get a number. And you want that number to be below 5,000. Doesn't matter what age, what medications you're on, you wanna keep that number to keep the risk of having a heart attack or a stroke below 1%. And 
And, and that line is linear. And I'll give an example. And there are actually papers written with this title, How to Live to be 100 Without Atherosclerosis. And I'll give an example at the risk of sounding, you know, tooting my own horn. And my LDL without any treatment is usually in the mid, you know, mid 40s to low 50s. And if I do everything else right, like, you know, Dr. Scott Stoll teaches and like American College of Lifestyle Medicine teaches, I do everything right and, you know, and I don't get hit by a drunk driver and make it to 100, it is mathematic, mathematically and biologically possible that I could, one could live to be 100 and not have atherosclerosis. And because unless, you know, except some rare genetic conditions, as humans, we are born with LDLs somewhere in the 30s to 50s. And, and most Americans, and kids even today are born with LDLs with 30s to 50s, but the way we eat, the way we conduct our business when it comes to diet, uh, because diet induced risk as of last month, 2022 global burden of disease is the, the leading contributor to cardiovascular disease, disability and death. We are allowing our LDLs to reach close to 125, 130 by the time we are 18 and 19. No wonder heart disease continues to be a leading cause of death. So that's kind of a one simple clinical pearl um, for for LDL. But like you said, you know, in terms of molecular mechanisms, the pathways, the data, we could really spend an entire you know se seminar um, or a workshop on this. But LDL is causal. Please, people, you know, a humble plea from an interventional cardiologist: don't meet me there. Don't meet. Don't ignore your LDLs. Talk to your cardiologist. Talk to an expert. Don't make personal health decisions based on social media taglines. Yeah, and I think just to kind of round that out before we go on to the next one, you know, for those watching, um, if you had to quantify the most um, powerful interventions that would impact or lower your LDL, how would you, how would you quantify those or characterize those, you know, from one to five or six? So, of all things in cardiovascular medicine, medicine in general, no matter what the, what the intent of treatment, primary, secondary, it's lifestyle, medicine, lifestyle, lifestyle, nutrition, it's the foundation of everything that we do. So if the intent of treatment is primary prevention, meaning that you never had a heart attack, never had any vascular event, and you wanna lower your LDL, as guidelines clearly suggest, change your diet first. If you already had a heart attack, if you already had a stroke, guess what, you still change your diet first, but as per guidelines, we would want you to be on a statin. But if you never had an event, six to six to eight weeks of TLC, therapeutic lifestyle medicine, therapeutic lifestyle changes, six at the apex of the lipid lowering guideline is nutrition. So, and we also know that a plant predominant diet or a plant exclusive diet, wherever you want to meet, depending on where you are in your life's journey of changing your diet, eat more vegetables, eat more lentils, eat more beans, eat more greens. Fiber literally lowers your LDL uh, very quickly. And I've seen in my personal experience of running two lifestyle medicine clinic over the past you know, six years, uh, numbers, you know, where patients would come back and tell me the best numbers that they have seen since they've been coming to the hospital 15 years ago. Some of these folks are, you know, people who are bypass operation. So I, it's the, the most practical tip is to lower your LDL, increase your fiber. America, please don't ask where your protein is, ask you where your fiber is. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Thank you, Kaushik. This, uh, I, I, yeah, I'm really excited about your talk at the PBNHC next fall because uh, you're going to be tackling some of these issues in more detail and yeah. diving into more of the science. So don't miss that next year, PBNHC, September 8th through 11th. Uh, back in Desert Palm, Dr. Reddy's going to be there um, tackling some of the most controversial questions in plant-based nutrition, including lipidology. So that's going to be great. Um, so let's take the next five minutes or so and talk about stress and mindfulness, because that's often, I've often said, you know, I, I always say this in my uh, immersions to people that, you know, stress is a wild card. You can have a really, you know, top-notch whole food plant-based diet. You can exercise and even get a good night's sleep. But if you have distress in your life that's overtaking you, it's going to undermine even the best efforts of a healthy lifestyle. Okay. And I know you're very interested in this as well. So maybe you can walk us through a little bit of the science of stress and heart disease, and then uh, touch on you know the power of mindfulness in mitigating stress, normalizing cortisol and the adrenal um, hormones, 
and how some of those studies show the, the reductions in, in cardiovascular disease. Absolutely. It's very interesting because I did not come prepared that we will be discussing stress, but it's interesting. This is heart month. And today I actually made a post on both Twitter and on LinkedIn outlining about 10 resources on stress, psychological stress and cardiovascular health. Uh, and if, for those of you who are listening, you know, if you go there, you will you know, kind of go to get a detailed review of about 10 citations that are contemporary. But in a nutshell, you know, uh, you know, a beautiful article written last year in New York Times titled, Stress May Be Your Heart's Worst Enemy. And I cannot emphasize this more. It's not my personal feeling or Dr. Stoll's personal feeling. We have objective data from all over the world. As far back as 2004, where data from 195 countries, pretty much every country on the planet was collected, looking at individual, each component of cardiovascular risk, hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, obesity, die, and then you add any one of those, and then you add the psychological stressors to any one metabolic risk. The odds of someone having a heart attack and a stroke just goes up exponentially. And yet, us as cardiologists, or most of us physicians outside psychology and outside mainstream psychiatry, this doesn't even come under our radar. We don't look for this. We don't talk about this to our patients. Uh, both depression and psychological stress are there directly linked to increased risk. The mechanisms, again, we can do an entire discussion on mechanisms, but there, most of them are cortisol and, and heart rate and sympathetic tone driven. Now we have actually, I linked one of the papers on Twitter or, and LinkedIn today, clearly showing that that, but almost like a pet mapping of the brain and the sympathetic nervous system and what it does to the endothelium. Mm -hmm. And thankfully in the past year or so, the American Heart Association put out a document, both for primary care doctors and cardiologists, or even for a layperson who wants to read, you can actually, how to, how to quantify this. That's, a, that's the key. You know, let's not say to ourselves that I don't have stress. We all have stress. But going back to the last part of Dr. Stoll's question is to the mindfulness practice. Is how do we do little things in our lives to mitigate stress? Because there was a beautiful paper published last year, looked at women with coronary stress. You know, people like it when you go for a stress test and the stress test is positive. And then they looked at people who have coronary stress, ischemic stress test being positive, but they also have emotional stress, right? Stress up here, stress down here, compared to people who don't have either or people who have only one. The re if you have emotional stress and myocardial stress, stress due to a blocked artery, the risk of having an event goes up by, I'm not misspeaking, 400 times. Wow. So it's, 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 it's that's, a, and the beauty is that if you manage stress through, through mindfulness practices, meditation, and, and, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, there's so many resources, unlike, you know, just as, you know, 20 years ago when I was a trainee. And objectively, we can measure that if we mitigate stress, your event rate goes down. And in terms of how do we do it, and that's where ultimately everything boils down to in the pillars of nutrition and lifestyle medicine is being mindful. Being mindful and accepting, starting as a beginner's mind that, hey, this is something that I need to address, something that I need to take charge. It's not gonna to happen tomorrow. It's not gonna to happen tomorrow. It's gonna to be baby steps tiny little event, anger management. There are actually impressive data on plaque rupture among people who live lives with sense of anger and hostility. Interestingly, the first author is Dr. Angerer. Okay, could not make <laughs> uh, But so yeah, there is enormous data and it's, 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 you know, it's, 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 it's nervous system basically inflaming your endothelium through, through few cellular and humoral and hormonal mediators. If I want to summarize like, you know, a textbook worth of information into three, three lines. And what is the simple first step that you give to your patients? My simple first step is I actually ask them a question. You know, when I talk about mindfulness, I said, they ask me, what do you want us to be mindful about? I said, well, my kind of mindfulness is not coming back with a halo behind your head and a rosary in your hand. That's not what I'm talking about. Although that works for a lot of people. But the kind of mindfulness is that always be mindful about what why do you want to be healthy? What is your why? And you come up with an answer. I just want you to be mindful about that. And then every time, you know, stress comes, you know, other temptations come through, think about that, you know, take a time, take some deep breaths, let, let those temptations and thoughts and angers dissipate. 
It's not going to be perfect. It's not, it's not, but if you keep on practicing on a day to look by day basis, week by week basis, then, then, then people have come back and give me feedback that, wow, they think with clarity, they, they make better decisions. They're not, you know, all these decisions, you know, nutrition related decisions, sleep related, all of them factors into stress. But stress is real, you know, even before COVID and COVID has made it even worse, but stress is real. Uh, we need to accept we have it. And so that's my first advice to give to my patients is to be acutely aware as to why you want to do it. Don't, you're not going to do it because just you heard me speak. You have, you have to find a true reason that matters to you. That's right. And then take a breath. Uh, breath is so powerful. Simply taking a big breath in through the nose, two in, four out, and yeah. changes everything. So. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You know, the, you know, the, the, you know, New York Times called it cardiac coherence breathing, actually scientific American, you know, but it, coming from where I come from, you know, we call this pranayama in, in India. Yes. Breathing practice has been, people have been doing this for, for forever. And um, yeah, yeah. But uh, the American name, I guess the scientific American published a data on this, calling it cardiac coherence breathing. It's basically, you know, mindful meditative breathing practices to calm our minds down. Fantastic. And let's take the last few minutes and talk about the last lost art of healing. Oh. We'll step back and look at this really important element of, um, of health care that's been lost in our, um, yeah. That's the book, yeah. <laughs> and you sent this to me. I want to appreciate you for that. You sent me this, this wonderful book Absolutely. because of the conversation at PBNHC. Uh, but it's really important, I think, for all of us as healthcare providers and non-healthcare providers to really, you know, step back and look at the, the, the real inherent value of relationships and our identity and opportunity to contribute to others. And um, I know you've been on a journey. And yeah. uh, so why don't you just share a little bit of your journey so, um, discovering this lost art I of healing? Journey, you know, I, I always, you know, was kind of connected at a, at a personal level with my patient, but just stepping into the, you know, behavioral modification side of medicine, that, you know, you know, imparting the value of lifestyle medicine onto my patients, friends, family, and colleagues, um, it's been the most humbling experience of my, you know, 30, 40 years in medicine, starting, you know, from the day when I joined medical school. What I mean by that is, you know, it's easy for me to say, you know, go home and do these six things that people lifestyle medicine. But when rubber hits the road, it is hard. But what I realized there very early on in my counseling of patients is that you have to meet a person as a person, not as a patient. You have to know, to know that human being as a fellow human being. And that takes time. That takes time. That takes effort. That takes sincerity. And then while I was in this search, I have to kind of reinventing myself. I came across this book by a cardiologist, a man who actually went on to win a Nobel Prize. Bernard Lohn uh, is, is one of those few men in you know, academic cardiovascular medicine. Most of us, my generation and previous two generations of cardiologists is one of those men who we all would walk the land, worship the land he walks on. Uh, not, not, not with a sense of you know, blind reverence, but for the contributions that he has made. And, um, and and one of the things that you know in, he has done long time ago, this perfect segue into the very first question about heart disease and risk and how do we manage them. As far back as 1981, this man had the wisdom to do a very simple trial and show that majority of cardiovascular disease, even in the setting of symptoms and an abnormal stress test, can be managed medically. Can be managed medically. He published a paper in New England Journal of Medicine in 1981. And then I, I strongly urge, I, I, to, to a point that for the past few years, I've been buying 10 copies every year and I actually give that uh, and, and Beth Frady's Lifestyle Medicine Handbook as a welcome gift to every cardiology fellow. And I tell them, I want you to read these two before I teach you cardiac catheterization and nuclear cardiology. Mm -hmm. That's so influential that book has been in my personal life and my professional life. And he passed away last year or year before, like four or five weeks short of a, uh, his 100th birthday, but he picked up another cause. He picked up another cause, Physicians for Nuclear Nonproliferation. His work was so influential, he's one of the main reasons, he's one of the you know, many influential reasons why Ronald Reagan you know, got into the treaty with the Soviet Union to cut down 
uh, nuclear arsenal. And for that reason, the man went on to win a Nobel Peace Prize. And so much so, some of you may know this, 2023, the US Mint is going to release dollar coins. Just like, remember the craze that we all had collecting the state quarters? They're going to be state uh, dollar coins. And the one from Maine is going to have Bernard Lone on it, a cardiologist. I mean, he, and, 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 you know, he also went on to invent the defibrillator. So yeah, fascinating. But most importantly, that little book that Dr. Sloan and I are showing on the screen is the, the, how to bring the human side of medicine without ever diluting the science of it. Okay, you know, how to, how to, you know, sometimes I literally pull a chair, sit down with the patient, hold their hands, and don't talk anything about medicine. I said, tell me what you did while you're in service. Tell me about your pets. Tell me about your children. And then somewhere along the line, you know, this concept of all of this falls into a broader category of motivational interviewing, probably the most important skill that we all need as doctors. But guess what? There's none structured in medical school, residency. Nobody teaches us motivational interviewing. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I could spend, you know, again, each one of those questions that Dr. Stoll asked perfectly, you know, phrased questions, but we could spend an entire day's worth of sem seminars and workshops on each one of those questions. But in the interest of time, uh, yeah, yeah, I, can, I am really passionate and of his work. And um, he actually called coronary intervention, coronary entrapment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. 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 <laughs> blog which somebody is still keeping alive and you know the command on English language and I read that book a couple of times I said how could somebody write like this and every word is such a powerful message and story after story yeah that's another thing you know if there are any young physicians listening learn to learn medicine as a story especially when you talk to patients yes yes you know individual case reports yes I agree that they are at the bottom of the the hierarchy of medicine case reports. But th that said, isn't all of our life a story? So learn to narrate their stories, learn to live those stories with your patients and friends and family. That's how you bring about a change. Not by lecturing to them or not by showing Kaplan Meyer curves and hearts. As, they're all good, we, we need to do that too. But when it comes to a fellow human being, recognize them as a human being in need. And hence those famous words by Dr. Harrison himself, no greater obligation, responsibility, or an opportunity can fall to the lot of a human being than that of to becoming a physician. Imagine making, having, to, having the responsibility to make decisions on somebody else's life with imperfect information that is ever changing. And the only way is that you have to connect with their person as a person, not as a patient, not as a diagnosis, not as a last name and, a, and some medical record number. So yeah, for any any you know any trainees of medicine, anybody or anybody, any just anybody who's interested in any medicine, I strongly urge you to read that book. Wow, thank you, Kaushik. I am so glad that we we dove into that last question because that's perhaps you know the most important part of this conversation. And somebody had written in there. I don't know if you saw that we need more doctor readies in this world, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know because you really do imbue all of the characteristics of a physician. You know, the compassion, the heart, the dedication, the intensity with which you pursue scientific solutions for patients. Um, you really are, in my mind, a physician. Thank you. So I am so thankful, Kaushik. Thank you for being here. And all of you, I hope you join us next year for the conference, Dr. Reddy and 22 other uh, people will be there much like Dr. Reddy um, at the conference. And, you know, I think, you know, Kaushik, you would agree. The greatest uh, joy for me at the conference is sitting around the table and having conversations together. You know, the, the lectures are fantastic and the content is amazing, but the relationships are invaluable. It's priceless. Now that I know, I, I just sensed that the minute you and I met, I mean, I felt like, you know, we could be talking for hours on end just to, expressing you know, our worldview, medicine, outside of medicine, so many things we could talk. But yeah, I truly meant it, Scott, when I said to you that you, know, you and I must have been brothers in another lifetime. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like a brother. I appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you. 
the title of the book. The title of the book is The Lost Art of Healing. I don't know if it's showing up as a mirror image on it, but it's about 10 bucks on Amazon. The Lost Art of Healing by a legendary physician who just passed away last year or year before um, with a subtitle, Practicing Compassion in Medicine. Yeah, marvelous, thank you. And for all of you watching too, um, uh, you know, the Plantrician University is our, um, our, our hope and intent to reach that next generation with this kind of information so that we can begin raising up a brand new type of healthcare practitioner that has the same kind of heart and uh, appraisal of the science that they can truly impact lives and communities. We have a matching grant opportunity right now uh, a wonderful, generous donor has provided a $75,000 matching grant. We're about halfway there. So if you'd like to join us in reaching 100,000 healthcare practitioner students in the next five years, uh, you can do so on plantritionproject.org. Uh, and I want to just thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. These conversations are absolutely priceless to me. And um, I want to thank Dr. Reddy Kaushik. Thank you so much for being here and taking time away from your busy schedule to, to share so much wisdom and um, uh, science and heart with us this afternoon. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Scott. And thanks for having me and uh, keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. And I look forward to talking to you soon, my friend. And thanks to all of you for joining. Have a wonderful night. If you need anything from us at all, you can reach, um, reach out to Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night.